Good afternoon, everyone. It is now officially uh, one minute after 12, I think. We're, we're calling it that on our uh, time clock back there anyway. So welcome. Glad to have you all here today. What a fantastic crowd at midday. It's such a pleasure for us to greet you today. My name is John Holler. I'm the CEO of the museum, and I'm just so happy that you're all here today. Grady Booch returns today for the second in a series of lectures that are the foundation of a major work that he's undertaken in partnership with a lot of people, an international advisory board, the museum, uh, KQED, a production company called Kick'em Media and others. Uh, it's a large scale view of computing's evolution, its impact and its implications for our future as a society. The project is called Computing, the Human Experience, and if you think of George Sagan and Cosmos meeting Grady Booch and computing, then you have the idea of the end goal for this series. The ultimate output by Grady will be a major book and a book series that will be published by O'Reilly Publishing, a great deal of digital media, and we hope a multi-part television series, as well, of course, uh, as this lecture series. Many of you know Grady as an IBM fellow, uh, you also know him as a legend in software development and in one of our favorite roles, which is as a trustee of the museum. But today, in his role as scholar and presenter, he looks at computing and what it means to be intelligent. That question at its base calls to mind the very question of what it means to be human. So it's my pleasure to begin this session entitled, I Think, Therefore I Am, and to introduce Grady Booch. The privilege of a lifetime said the mythologist Joseph Campbell, is being who you are. I am not a cognitive scientist. The only claim to fame I have in that space is I have a self-identified entity that I call an I. And that I comes to you today to ponder the question as to whether or not intelligence is indeed something, or the mind, is indeed something that is computable. Now, when we speak of an I, it brings to mind Descartes, who observes that I think, therefore I am. However, once we go there, immediately we have a number of conundrums. And I think a great way to present it is from Star Trek. And we're going to take a look at a scene here between Picard and Data, when Data is on trial, because they are dealing with the very nature of what sentience is. Would you enlighten us? What is required for sentience? Intelligence, self-awareness, consciousness. Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. So I am sentient, but Commander Data is not. That's right. Uh -huh. Why? Why indeed is the question. And this is the problem of many minds. I believe that each of you is sentient. I'm not addressing Congress, so I think I'm reasonably OK with that. So, <laughs> but to prove to you, or for you to prove to me that you're sentient, is something that I have to take on faith to some degree, and also have to take on the belief that I meet you, I greet you, and I know that there is the spark of something inside that makes you distinctly you, and therefore both of us distinctly human. However, if you look at the fabric of life in the universe, one of the things that we are coming to understand is that the components of life appear to be very common. But at the same time, it appears that complex life and ergo sentient life appear to be very uncommon. So across what we know life to be here on this planet at least, and across the spectrum from viruses and on up, one thing we know is the genetic material appears to be the same. And there reaches some threshold that you cross, at which point in time we have nervous systems that begin to come into play, that provides, at the very least, a communication mechanism within multicellular animals. There's another threshold you cross over in which you begin to get some whispers of that sentience. We know, for example, that porpoises can self-identify themselves in mirrors. Elephants are known to mourn for a dead mate. And chimpanzees, in particular, develop some very complex social structures. So even within the life as we know it here, it is difficult for us to say 
Sentience is beyond this line, but not before it. There's something fuzzy in there. But we know that someplace there is a threshold we cross which says, yes, indeed, there is a life, a consciousness inside. Well, what then do we mean by sentience? This, too, is a slippery topic. And it's something that, from cognitive scientists to philosophers to religious men and women, have not fully gotten their arms around. So we can begin to think of some of the components in it, there is an issue of self-awareness. I know that I am. There's a sense of intentionality, the ability to set goals that are beyond yourself and meet them, some degree of intelligence, and some sense of creativity. But even these words are very slippery. We sort of know it when we see it, but it's really difficult to get our arms around. Interestingly, like throughout our history, it has been the case that we have desired to create other intelligences. We have this burning need inside us, it seems, to be as if we are gods, creating these sentient beings that serve us. So you can go back to the times of uh, Prague. There was a, uh, this amazing uh, uh, Jewish uh, leader who had the legend about him that there was indeed this golem that he could bring about and help defend the Jewish population there. This is a, a clay replica of, of the Prague Golem. And what he was able to do is he could take the name of God written down, put it inside the Golem, and it would come to life and do his bidding. And curiously, if you erase the first letter of the name he would put on the forehead, the name which represented in Hebrew truth, erase the first letter, it becomes the word death. And that's how he turned off the golem to do his bidding. And of course, there are wonderful stories about how the golem didn't listen and just went on a rampage. These ideas of us creating an intelligence have been part of our myths and our stories for a long time. Indeed, move up to the time of Leonardo da Vinci. He was, if you remember my first lecture about uh, conflict and computing, you may recall that he was in the employ of a variety of people to build weapons of war. And one of the weapons he posited was indeed this, this uh, armored soldier that would move on its own. And the idea being that it's much, much better to use these things as opposed to real life human beings. Move ourselves up now to today where you have robots uh, such as the Kaneshiro robot coming out of Japan, which is very, very lifelike indeed. I mentioned the notion of us becoming gods. Stuart Brand had a, a wonderful observation of this in the very beginning of the whole Earth catalog in which he said, we are as gods, and so we might as well get used to it. One of the things that's happened in the evolution of computing technology is we now appear to have sufficient computational power and efficient, sufficient understanding of how one might architect these things to make us to the point where we can be as gods. So the question for me, therefore, is how much of a mind can we build from the tapestry of silicon and software. How far can we go? Now again, in literature, in our mythology, we have this fascination with artificial life. And for me, it's a reflection of both what we hope for, as we saw with the golem. We hope for a liberator. We hope for a, a helpmate for us. But it also represents the things in which we fear. And you can see that from the, the Cylon to uh, uh, AI to, uh, to HAL itself. They're a reflection of our basic human needs. And so they're, as Joseph Campbell would say, they're clearly exposing something deep within us. But oftentimes, our mythologies turn to the dark side, where what we fear the most comes on top. And so we fear these robotic uprisings. And we see this a lot in the movies, like this kind of iRobot. Great movie, fascinating special effects. Um, it has been said that the soul resides in the dark palace of our brain. Is there a soul in these things? If you look back to religious beliefs, we'll begin there, and I think we could have some fascinating discussions about the religious implications of building sentient machines. You know, we find here in Genesis how life comes, where it reads, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
So for centuries, the belief was that this notion of a spirit was something that came down from God. And indeed, Descartes, the dude we spoke of earlier, I can't believe I just called Descartes a dude. <laughs> but, sorry. <laughs> The guy who said, I think, therefore I am, also suggested that, yes, indeed, we have this mechanism in our brain called the pineal gland, and this is the place that talks to God. We take in sensory input, we sort of talk to the pineal gland, it talks to the spirit world out there someplace, and it then moves our body. And this was the belief for the longest time, that this is how our spirit came into our place. Move ourselves now to the cusp of the Industrial Revolution and you find a very different kind of, the wor of debate going on here. Uh, this is the time where we were beginning to realize that there are mechanistic explanations for things that previously were uh, speculative in terms of you know, being out there, something that, that was supernatural. If you look at the time of, of Charles Babbage, he got into this wonderful debate with William Weehall, who was an Anglican priest, I think he later became the master of Trinity College, in which, on the one hand, Weehal was an anti-mechanist. He was very much in the line of Descartes, not knowing where the mechanism took place, but indeed our spirit came from something supernatural. Whereas Babbage took a very different view, this is the time frame of him building the difference engine and the analytic engine, and said, no, I have a, a deep belief that there is a, a mechanistic explanation to this. And yet, Babbage was also a very religious man. And where he landed, I believe, in his understanding is that, yes, the mind emerges from the brain, but it's only because we have a divine programmer. So it's mechanistic, but there is a divine programmer who brings that to us. I think it comes as no surprise that in that same mix, we have Charles Darwin, who was often at many of at Babbage's parties there's a long correspondence between the two talking about these very issues. And it was the same time that Darwin was struggling with the implications of his ideas of evolution. So these mechanistic spiritual issues were very much in the forefront and the implications of what would it mean to build a sentient being. But obviously we were far ahead of our blocking relative to what could be done in this space. There are a lot of consequences for the topic we have in front of us. There are economic, there are emotional, there are moral. All of these things come into play for us. And I think that's why it moves us so much to consider the question for us. Now, another element of this is not so much what can sentient beings that we create do to us, but the other way of looking at it is what should our relationship to them be? And notice I'm already anthropomorphizing them by calling them a them. And this would be true even if I build true sentience or if I build the illusion of sentience. And we see here again our last Star Trek click, clip. Guinan has this same issue in mind. In many worlds, there have always been disposable creatures. They do the dirty work. They do the work that no one else wants to do because it's too difficult or too hazardous. And an army of data is all disposable. You don't have to think about their welfare. You don't think about how they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. It is a sad commentary upon humanity, I guess you could say, that many civilizations have enslaved lots of people to do their bidding, to do the dirty work. Uh, as I was sitting there uh, getting ready for this, I overheard a conversation. Someone asked the question, would it be moral to have a sentient device and turn it off. These are some of the issues that come up here. And I'd reframe the question by saying, what happens if we build a device that even has the illusion of sentience? What should our relationship be to them? We'll touch upon this a little bit more later. However, let's be very pragmatic and take the perspective that Joseph Campbell had, which is, wait a minute. Don't computers do exactly what we tell them to do? And he said it in his wonderful style. Computers are like Old Testament gods, lots of rules and no mercy, especially if you have windows, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. Yes, I am a, I am a Mac fanboy. So yeah, that's, that's a reasonable perspective to consider. And his is not a new perspective, but it's one that even Ada Lovelace had as she was collaborating uh, with Charles Babbage, she made the observation of the analytic engine. 
in a little bit more flowery terms, it has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. And I think that's a reasonable view except it neglects the notion of building systems of systems. And one of the things that we have learned really in the last decade or two is that very curious behavior can come from systems in unpredictable ways that emerges from the creation of very simple rules with these things interacting with one another in ways that we cannot anticipate. So it is this notion of that emergent behavior, the notion of systems of systems, that I think leads us to some very fruitful ground with the notion of building sentient devices. Just take a look at ASMO, for example. ASMO is not sentient by any means, but it creepily looks human, especially in the way it moves. ASMO is um, a humanoid robot uh, built by Honda, and what you're seeing here is a scene in which an army of ASMOs are greeting some people coming to the door of an office. They're identifying who they are. I don't know if it's facial recognition or not. And then saying, oh, I recognize who you are, therefore I will direct you to this person's office, or in this case, uh, this robot is saying, please sit down here and wait. But what creeps me out about this is that you see humans actually interacting with these devices as if they were very much humanoid-like. So we're back to the notion of the illusion of intelligence and sentience. Let's spend a few minutes here talking about the science of what we know about the brain. The human brain is roughly the size of a cantaloupe, weighs about three pounds, and it consumes the energy of about a hundred watt light bulb. Within that space, every command of every king, the dream of every peasant, the tear of every lover, of the seven billion people that live on our earth now, and the some hundred or so billion people who have been before us, they all generated within that space. And that's remarkable, I believe, because from that we have created our own universe. So it leads us to the question, how did that come to pass? How is it this gel that fits within here has given rise to poems and and uh, civilizations and amazing creations like the computer. How is that so? Well, at the bottom we know that the brain is made of a set of neurons, and we reasonably understand the nature of those neurons. Those neurons, like systems of systems, band together in groups. Those groups form other regions. The regions form the brain itself. And we know reasonably the structure of these things. It used to be the case we thought neurons were very binary in their nature, but they're a little bit more complex than that. Yes, they are electrical in their signals, and they're mostly on or off, but there appear to be some interesting historical things with it. In other words, they, they know about time triggered kinds of events. Uh, they appear to be sending messages that are more than just ones and zeros. But it also appears that we know how to simulate these things to a reasonable level of fidelity. Neurons bind themselves together, and within the brain we have about 100 billion neurons, and each of those neurons has on average of about 7,000 connections, connections, synapses, so we end up with about 100 to 500 trillion connections within the brain itself, very, very complex device itself. And these things band together. Now, what you're looking at here is a simulation of neurons within a brain that is reflecting the studies that now indicate that mental states appear to equate with brain states, and it goes both ways. So we can look at a scan of the brain and tell if you're looking at this object versus that object. We can tell if you're in a certain emotional state because different parts of the brain light up in different ways. And the inverse is true. We can trigger a certain part of the brain and it causes the body and the emotions to act in a different way. So there is clearly some mind-brain thing going on here much deeper than we ever stood in the past, which leads us to suggest that maybe there is a mechanistic explanation to it. And if only we understood the architecture of this connectivity, we could derive some degree of sentience. Well, that was the brain science. Let's spend a little time upon the journey of artificial intelligence, which gets us there. And this is a marvelous journey. We often say in, in our work here on, 
on this uh, documentary series, the story of computing is the story of humanity. And the story of AI is very much that. It's a story of serendipity and brilliance and avarice and disappointment. It's really a very compelling story. And I think the essence of it, we hear here from Ed, which tells us what that manifest destiny is. The manifest destiny of computer science. That is the end of the road. That is, if you're, if you're going to use the, which I love to do, the Lewis and Clark metaphor of starting out of St. Louis and slogging your way through the Missouri Valley and up the mountains to wonderful places that are difficult to achieve, the goal is the ocean. And AI is the goal. And uh, you can stop along the way. You can have a wonderful life in Salt Lake City doing whatever, graphics, or you can stop in Denver and do databases, or, but the goal is AI. Now, the goal is an artificial intelligence, an artificially created mind. Let's take a look at that journey that we've gone through, and we can begin with some of Turing's ideas. Of course, Turing in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, posited the question. And he had this notion of the imitation game. And his metric for intelligence or sentience was that a computer could fool another human. It was from this was born the idea of the Turing test. Turing himself, of course, did not call it this. It was in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey when he was speaking of HAL that he spoke of this as the Turing test and thus the name was born. There are debates as to whether or not the Turing test is a meaningful metric for it, but I think if we go back to Turing himself and say it's enough to give us the illusion of intelligence, of the illusion of sentience, we know we're very much on to something. So let's take a short journey here in terms of where we have been in trying to build an intelligence, and then we're going to end up with where it appears the next frontiers are and how far those might lead us. The beginning, I think, was, was really at Dartmouth in 1956. There were a number of researchers that came together, and it was at that conference that the term artificial intelligence was coined. But if you see some of the echoes that came out of World War II, there was a lot of fascinating work that was going on with control systems. We have people like Norbert Wiener, uh, communications theory idea from, from Shannon, was in the mix around this time frame. And it was during this period that Wiener observed the phrase, uh, which he took from Greek, uh, kybernetes, which he took as this notion of feedback systems within machines and within animal systems. And thus we get the term cyber, and it comes back from, from Norbert's ideas. It's Greek for to steer or to pilot. Now, one of the researchers in this space, uh, and I was influenced by him when I was a kid reading some of his works, was Gray Walter and his tortoises. He had uh, Elmer and Elsie, I believe it was. And they were very simple, simple kind of systems. My gosh, you can buy a kid's toy now that does this. But they had photoelectric cells. They would sort of follow some light. They knew how to get back to their food, which was their power. The really fascinating thing, and I haven't found any pictures of it or videos of it, is if you put Elmer and Elsie in the room together and put a light on each of them and turn the lights out, and you would see this wonderful, very realistic kind of mating dance between the two. So something was going on there. And what we discovered at that time frame is, yes, indeed, there are some things we can do at the bottom that give us the illusion of animalistic kind of behavior, but clearly there are very much limits upon what we can do here. We were, again, ahead of our blocking and what was possible. The next phase, which was really the golden age of AI, was the time of semantic information processing or symbolic processing. And it started off with a bang. Here you've got people uh, uh, such as Herbert Simon and his logic theorist and the like that were exploring the notion of let's make the assumption that the brain is a symbol processor. So how far can we go with taking these symbols of the outside world and seeing the ways in which we can manipulate them? So this led us to things such as uh, uh, the uh, Blocks World from Terry Winograd, which was one of the first really interesting attempts at natural language processing. The Blocks World could 
parse and understand you know, some basic limited language. We had also here during this time Shaky, and you can wander through the Revolutions exhibit downstairs and you'll see Shaky sitting down there. Shaky, of course, begat a lot of interesting ideas. It was from Shaky the notion of, of uh, mapping systems began to appear, uh, the algorithms for how one could map a path. So what we found during this time frame is you could go a certain distance with symbol processing, but you could also creep some people out such as what we found with ELISA, Joseph Weizenbaum's program. Very, very simple program. But what was fascinating for me was not so much what ELISA did, which represented a Rogerian psychotherapist, but the way that people reacted to ELISA. You would see these transcripts where people would just bare their souls to this program as if they were speaking to a real psychotherapist. So we see that our threshold as humans is perhaps very easy in terms of anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing these things. We are open to accepting that there is some sentience within them. However, there are clear limits to what can be done here. During the Protestant Revolution, there was this crisis of faith when Calvin came along and had this notion of uh, predestination. It got everybody up in arms talking about the notion of the implications of that for free will. We saw the same kinds of crisis going on with people such as Herbert Dreyfus, who was positing that, wait a minute, the basic fundamentals you are assuming here along this path are utterly flawed. And in particular, he attacked, and I think rightfully so, some of the basic assumptions that the symbologists of this time were making. One of the assumptions being that the brain's digital. Well, we thought it was, but clearly it's not purely digital, uh, although in the defense of the AI community, we're discovering that neurons indeed are simulatable on, on a machine. And so, yeah, we kind of sidestepped the issue. Uh, he also observed that the brain does not operate in really formal ways. That's true, at certain levels it does not, but again, this is really before the ideas of systems theory came into play. He also attacked the notion that knowledge was not enough, that you really can't formalize the things that are out in the outside world. And I think this is largely a reflection of the contemporary AI research at the time, which was mostly disembodied. Except for things like Shaky, we were trying to deal with intelligences that were inside a box as opposed to interacting with the outside world. A very famous thought experiment that came around this time was John Searle's uh, Chinese room experiment in which he posited the notion of a room in which you would be fed Chinese letters, Chinese characters, Chinese words. There would be a person inside who would have a full table of translating these things and then he would munch through those tables and pass them outside. And what Searle pointed out was there's no way that the man inside that box understands anything. I think that's very true, but the critics of Searle's thought experiment have observed it's not the man who is the person that should understand, it's the system. His analogy would be like saying the CPU of a computer doesn't understand, and that's true, but it's not the CPU itself, it's the aggregate of the whole. So his experiment is interesting, but it does have some holes within it if you really push it to its limits. The next great phase of AI was the period of expert systems and knowledge engineering in the time of, of Ed and many others. And I think what we discovered here in this time frame, it's not so much simple manipulation, but rather it's trying to take piles of knowledge from experts and seeing if we can manipulate that knowledge in interesting ways. Uh, so thus was born the notion of a knowledge expert who would work in an interface between the machine and a knowledge and, and somebody who actually physically had that knowledge. Maybe it's somebody who worked at, say, Campbell Soup, who knew by taste and smell and touch really how to mix these soups properly. And so I would want to extract from that person the rules of thumb they use, largely done in the form of if-then rules. If this is true and this is true and these circumstances are such, then do this. And what you'd accumulate are these sets of rules, generally in an if-then form, and you'd bind them all together and use an inference engine to sort of walk through them. Now, this led us to some interesting discoveries with mycin and dendril, and, and indeed, even today, there are commercial uses of it. We can codify the knowledge 
of certain experts and do things that previously a human would have been required to do. But the limiting factor here is that there's no common sense in these things. If I want to tell a machine that water is wet and all the implications of water being wet, I must expound upon hundreds upon hundreds of such rules. Now, there's one organization that's headed that direction. That's where Psych is. Uh, Psych was uh, uh, Doug uh, Lenat's uh, ideas back around this time frame. And he has continued on with the idea of Psych to today, where there's a commercial company that embodies these things. So again, the notion is that common sense is really, really hard to codify. So again, there are things we know we can do, but we haven't really gotten to that spark yet. Another approach was considering maybe we've got the wrong problem relative to what intelligence is. And the notion of playing games was often considered a mark of intelligence. Oh, if I could build something that could play checkers or chess or go and beat me consistently, it would clearly indicate there's some intelligence going on. People tried this for centuries with things such as the, the Turk, which of course was a complete sham because there was a human that was placed inside of it, but it fooled everybody from Bonaparte on down. I think at one time we had an exhibit here at the museum on that. So another approach was to say, well, wait a minute. We don't necessarily have to follow exactly what the brain does. Let's use the things that we know within our computers and use, exploit that power. So let's apply some brute force methods. So that led us to things like Deep Blue. Now, a, a human expert, can, a human chess player, can look ahead you know, a few half dozen moves which is far better than a beginning player can do, and that's one thing that differentiates them. It's also the case that a human grandmaster can see patterns across the whole board. Well, the approach that was taken in Deep Blue and many other systems like this was simply say, we're going to outsmart the human by going down to 20 levels or so. There was this fascinating time in one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, competitions between Kasparov. In the end, Kasparov lost, and he thought that we cheated. But there was one time where Deep Blue made this utterly stupid, random move. And it was part of the algorithm that said, uh, Deep Blue was running out of time so that I don't forfeit my turn. I'm just going to make a move. And Deep Blue chose that move. But Kasparov, projecting his anthropomorphization into Deep Blue, said, wow, that was utterly brilliant. And obviously, I did not understand it. So he labored over it and got himself actually into a mistake because he thought the machine was more brilliant than he was. The illusion of intelligence, Kasparov lost. He blinked, and Deep Blue doesn't blink. The next level, which is pretty much where we are today, is on the level of statistical approaches, using Bayesian methods and other methods like that to give us the illusion of intelligence. And one great example of that is what Watson has done. Uh, Watson, if you may recall, a couple of years ago, beat all of the leading human players in the game of Jeopardy. So this is an interesting problem, because unlike the blocks world, which is a very limited language, the problem that Watson had to face was natural language that was a fairly unlimited vocabulary, but it was also dealing with ambiguity, conflict of information, and you had to deal with problems of puns and entomology. So if I, if I use a word in a certain way, it actually may sound like or it may be a play on words. Watson had to in some way know about that. There's a very telling example that came from one of the competitions in which the, 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 the question was, let me get it here to get it to be right. The clue was, it was this anatomical oddity of US gymnast George Eitzer. Anybody know the answer? Are you better than Watson? Anybody? So Jennings even didn't get it right. His answer was missing a hand. Eh, wrong answer. Watson thought for a bit and came back with the answer or the question, what is a leg, which is also wrong. The real answer is, what is missing a leg? So it's very telling because even in these cases, Watson made the same kind of, a different kind of mistake than Jennings did. Let me give you a dialogue that I had with Watson one day. So Watson, in the category Gravity's Rainbow, this scientist said that he understood how it behaved, but not how it worked. Watson? Who is Sir Isaac Newton. Correct. Now Watson, we've seen from Mr. Shepard's presentation how you behave. Would you be willing to explain to us how you work? I'm sorry, Grady. 
I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> Sorry and afraid, two very curious words to come from a software intensive Turing complete system. Watson, are you feeling okay? I'm completely operational and all my circuits are functioning <laughs> perfectly. Now, let me be excruciatingly clear. Watson is not sentient like Hal. So the first part of that was a real question in dialogue. The last part of it was obviously scripted, but let's tear apart the first one. In the category of gravity's rainbow, I asked the question, which was a paraphrasing of a quote from Newton. So what Watson had to look at or think about was parsing that sentence and finding things that would match against it. Indeed, this is how Watson works, and I'll explain in a moment more. It's very cool because Watson is now going to the next level where it's graduated from Jeopardy and announced just recently uh, Watson has been applied at, uh, at a hospital looking at diagnosing uh, uh, signs of cancer within, uh, within MRI scans and x-rays and the like. So it's acting as a physician's assistant. Here's how Watson works. Um, at one end, you get the questions. This is the Jeopardy playing version of it. You get the questions, which then Watson parses in interesting ways. And then it does some forward chaining, forming some hypotheses as to what possible candidate answers there might be. And on average, it'll produce about 1,000 of these possibilities. Then it takes those possibilities and tries to find evidence that supports each of those. That's the backward chaining. And then it comes up with a ranking of those so that we can now say, with a certain level of confidence, I believe this is the answer, the next level of confidence in this. And in Jeopardy, Watson would only answer when it reached a certain level of confidence. And this is the kind of feedback that Watson is giving to a doctor even as well here. So the fascinating other thing not mentioned in this is that Watson also learns along the way. So that in the series of questions you might ask it, Watson begins to frame the problem a little bit better and so it can do better searches. So again, we're using the power of the machines. We threw a lot of hardware at it and this thing was able to give a response within a sub-second time frame and reach out to a vast knowledge base and then parse them and give me these letters or the answers in some degree of confidence. Where are we going next and where's the current thought in this space? Uh, the ideas of society of mind, the notion of building systems as the place where the palace of the soul lives appears to be taking root. And there are really two aspects of this I want to touch upon. One of these is the notion that comes from Marvin Minsky in his ideas from society of mind, and I'll let him explain it in his own words. When we make machines that have these multiple levels of organization, we'll find that when, if the machine manages, if we manage to make it uh, have the same sort of structure that the human brain has, we don't know enough about that yet to do it, that it will report the same sorts of things. And when it says, I see blue, we'll be able to see all the processes that this involve. And we'll also see that it doesn't involve much understanding of what that process is, and so it seems very mysterious and unphysical. I've never had the chance to meet with Dr. Minsky, but I have the sense that if you tied his hands down, <laughs> he wouldn't be able to think or talk. <laughs> so, at any rate, what he's saying is that there is something about these this massive parallelism of lots of simple things working together in ways that give us the emergent behavior. In fact, we see this notion of emergent behavior in things such as the flocking of birds. And there are very simple rules that a bird has to know. They don't step back and say, today I shall flock. But rather, I had to pronounce that very carefully, but rather the individual bird says, well, wait a minute, I'm going to keep a certain separation between my mates here. That's one rule. I'm going to go in the general direction my other mates are going, and I want to keep my general position within this particular mass. Those three simple rules of local behavior em let me emerge the behavior of these kinds of swarms. And so the question now on the table is, can we apply those same kinds of ideas of society, massive parallelism, to bringing about a different kind of sentience? Another aspect of this comes from Rodney Brooks and his notion, which was really the antithesis of where most robotics was going around the time frame he began this, which was 
minds need to come from bodies, that you really can't evolve a mind without having some contact with the external world. And from his ideas emerge what some call a subsumption architecture, the notion that if you look at a mind, there are many levels of behavior. A behavior at the bottom, which we're controlling things mechanistically, a level below that, which has certain goals, which impact the behaviors below it, and so on and so forth, until you get to the top level of the mind itself. We see this embodied in things like kismet. And kismet was not so much a robot that had a body that sensed the world, but rather a body that interacted with the world. And the fascinating thing about kismet is the way you would see humans interact with it. It was the first emotional robot, if you will. Uh, Dr. Brooks followed on with thinking, it's darn cute, too. You know, you want to have one of those at home. But, but Dr. Brooks went on to produce a thing called COG and, and a whole line of robots in this space to explore that kind of interaction. And he would begin to see the illusion of emotion coming from kismet. And these ideas have embodied themselves very pragmatically in places such as the Mars Curiosity rover. These are semi-autonomous robots. We can't uh, obviously dry them with a joystick from here on Earth because of the, the latency between here and Mars. But what we can say is, here's a very interesting rock. Uh, go find it and be sure you get yourself to that place without falling into a, into a crater or hitting that rock. Using modified algorithms of what we began to see in Shakey's time frame. Well, this is all well and good, but is it enough? Are the ideas of symbolic manipulation or knowledge engineering or, or the, even the ideas of society of mind enough to build sentience? There are many who suggest, no, this is not true. And Roger Penrose, in particular, has some very interesting arguments that spring from some manipulations of Gödel's theorem to some things that may happen down at the quantum level of the brain. Mathematical understanding. Mathematical understanding depends upon consciousness. But mathematical understanding is not something of a purely computational character. There is something else which has to come into that. So that's, the mathematics only comes in to demonstrate that there is some part of our conscious thinking which you cannot simulate on a computer. I respect his viewpoint. I believe he's wrong. There are others who have expressed criticisms of what we've done. he's done from a variety of perspective. And so to be clear, I do take the perspective that the mind is computable. I respect the position that others may believe it is not so. And even if you believe it is not so, one must still consider the question of how far one can go in building a mind from silicon and software. How far can we go in building this illusion of sentience? We know in Hawaiian tradition, there is this greeting called the Honi, in which two people will meet, they'll come face to face, they'll both exhale, and they will share the breath of life, the Ha, as it is called. And you know in that meeting that there is another sentient being there with you. There is a spark, there is something inside. And it gives us pause to ask the question, what is the nature of that spark? What truly does it mean to be human that distinguishes us from these things that even have the illusion of sentience? Is it having a sense of humor? Is it a sense of irony? The ability to have a sense of death? And yet one can argue that even these things are goals for which a machine could have the illusion of as well. Now, this idea of machines embodying spirit may be difficult for us in the West to absorb, but if you look in Shintoism, it's reasonably understandable because this is very much a part of that belief system that all things are embodied with some degree of life. It is therefore no surprise that you are seeing both religious perspective as well as economic perspective coming together within Japan, which is leading to a renaissance of humanoid and sentient acting like devices, all the way from things like this, which is meant for elderly. Yes, 
The hairball option is action. Or, or if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Well, if you think about it, you can do it. Of, of comfort and an outpouring of where I can nurture something. Devices like that, the illusion of there being a spark inside makes a whole lot of sense. There's some interesting work going on in Canada I am Android, with this robot. And I was created by Trungla. I am the first Canadian Android to make a public appearance. Notice this Android yes. can express May I help touch. You? Please go straight, then turn to、he、your asks, right, the and you will see the washroom. Michael, relax your arm. And now he said, "Please relax your arm." I am relaxed now. Michael, tell me when you feel pain. Tell、Understood. me when you feel pain. I will let you know. She's parsing the natural language coming. From I am、you. starting to feel it. Please let go of my arm. You are hurting me. Why did you do that for? It's hurt. A very, very natural reaction. I don't want to do this anymore. I do not like it when you touch my breasts. Good for her. So what's fascinating about this is we know there's a program running in there, and yet if you had someone off the streets that began to interact with a device such as this, you'd probably get them to the point where they say, "Wait a minute, there's something going on inside here. How far can we indeed go?" The vision for strong AI. Has not diminished, but what's really happened, it appears, is that we are fearing the robots taking over. They are, but in ways that we don't necessarily expect, because many of the fruits from that journey of AI that I spoke of are finding their ways in the interstitial spaces of our world, in places like the movies. This comes from a, a teaser reel, a trailer reel from. Uh, Massive, the company out of New Zealand. If you ever watch a show that has lots of people in it, and assuming it's not a Cecil B. DeMille movie where he was able to hire thousands of actors, most of these are created、uh, by by computer, and we basically have agents here that have a set of rules for how they interact with the things around them, much like flocking, and thus you get this behavior. Apparently, in some of the early tests for. The ogre scenes in *Lord of the Rings*, you would see cases where the rules were wrong, and ogres would start fighting each other and then going the other direction. And so, until they fine-tune the rules, you got the behavior that looked good enough. Similarly, this is a company that Rodney Brooks has started since he left MIT, and it is a, a robot that has common sense. What's fascinating for me about this one is this is a robot that you actually teach by walking it through its motions. And then it knows some basic rules about the world. The eyes that it have, completely unnecessary. They are a cosmetic thing that make us feel good about it. It's not looking in that direction, but it gives us the illusion that is looking in that direction to give us some sense that there's something going on inside there. Similarly, if you look at what's happening inside the Google car, this is、uh, a video from inside the car itself. There's a, a reporter in the back seat here, and there's a great scene. I turned the audio off, in which he said, "I really don't believe you're, you're, the, the car is driving itself. Take your hands off the wheel." And he does ah, and she goes ah. So it really is. So again, you've got a vehicle that obviously has no sentience in it, and yet it's doing things that in the past. We certainly would have considered、uh, requiring intelligence on our part, and now it becomes a little bit more interesting, because if you look at the kinds of drone warfare that are going on, we are building a generation of autonomous devices that kill, and so we're beginning to put inside them a sense of value. I've unleashed a drone. I'm going after a target, but as it gets close, it identifies. Wait a minute, this is not a cemetery. This is a schoolyard. Therefore, I perhaps should not fire my my weaponry. 
So already we're beginning to take some of our values into it, into these systems of the illusion of sentience, and embodying these devices with it. So the moral implications aren't going away. We are already building values into these things for which there is a nature of responsibility. And that is indeed, I think, one of the, one of the, the ethical issues one must consider relative to sentient devices. Where does the responsibility lie with it? If a Google car gets into an accident, who do I sue, if you want to be really practical? Uh, do I sue the owner of the car? Do I sue the car itself? Do I sue the programmers behind it? Believe me, we're going to see lawsuits in this space, and law is going to be set. Law is going to be set here that is going to impact the law precedents for Android-like robots as well, so pay attention in that space. The same thing is happening with drones as well. We are setting legal precedents uh, very different than the three laws of robotics that are going to impact sentient devices for some time to come. But it, we just sue everybody. That's right. That's right. What if you have a robotic lawyer? Ooh. Ooh. Not a bad idea, maybe. But that's the, the moral issue. Let's take a look at a different aspect. How many times have you been on a cell phone, a phone trying to talk to a human and go through you know, some sort of phone tree? There is generally some device sitting there that is parsing your words, trying to figure out what you mean, annoying you in new ways. It may be also at checkout lines at the grocery store, or it might be checking into a, uh, uh, to an air flight, or you might have a Roomba inside your, your house, or for those of you who have uh, Mac devices, message. you've got Siri. New message from Sebastian. Great news. We got the go ahead. Can you meet at 10? Reply. Definitely. I'll see you there. Play my running mix. What's the traffic like around here? Here's the traffic. What strikes me about each of those, notice what was not there. There were no other humans interacting. So part of what's happening, which is part of the larger trends in computing, is that we are slowly surrendering our intelligence, our choice, our responsibility to devices such as this. And that has some tremendous economic implications, because in each of those cases, there were no other people I needed to interact with. So in effect, the journey we are on to build these sentient-like devices is leading us to a point where humanity does not lead humans as much as we needed to. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons behind the global economic malaise we are in today is a reality that a lot of those kinds of, kinds of jobs that required some degree of judgment, some degree of intelligence, we can now outsource to our machines. They aren't sentient, but they are replacing the things that previously we would consider in that space. Here's the next frontier where we are. There are two fascinating projects going on, and they suggest a renaissance in the connectionist model applying AI. On the one hand, you have the, uh, uh, the brain project, the human brain project going on in the European Union, which is being funded to the tune of about 100, uh, 100, million, 100 million euros over the next 10 years, and that's the project on the top. And its intent is to map the entire human brain, but then also make a simulation of it. In Obama's uh, State of the Union address, he also spoke of a similar kind of challenge, what he called the brain activity map. This is, for Obama, what the space race was for Kennedy. He views that as the next frontier, our ability to map the entire brain. And if you look very closely at some of the things going on in DARPA, you will see projects that are being funded to try to build uh, silicon replicants of of neurons themselves and massing them together. Indeed, it was just a few months ago before, before Christmas that at a, an AI conference, um, it was announced there was a team that had actually gotten to the point we have been able to build a device that has as many silicon neurons as the brain itself. So we know we're on the path to be able to do that. So there's a challenge, however because the scale of what we've seen from the past is very, very different indeed. From the, the, best, the best parallel is what we saw with the Human Genome Project. But the human genome contains about 3 billion base pairs, and within a single DNA strand, about 200 million bits of information, which is less information, and this is not even compressed, less information than a single picture you might take from your iPhone. 
On the other hand, within the brain, when we're talking about these hundred billion kinds of neurons, we're talking about a billion billion bits of information that a single brain in a dynamic state might take place over a day long of processing. So the scales of big data are vastly different. And on the one hand, that's an interesting challenge, and it's going to push us on the big data side of things. How do we process all this stuff? On the other hand, I think much like what happened with the CERN project, uh, the, the Large Hadron Collider, once you start moving to things of scale like this, we will begin to discover things we could only begin to think about from decades past. This is where we are now, and this is on the cusp of where sentient work is taking place. It leads me to pause and ask the question, what does it mean to be human? We are on a journey much like what we saw in literature from the days of the Gollum to the Kenshiro robot, to try to build replicants of sentient devices in ways that use silicon and software. And yet you know and I know, like I said at the very beginning, there is a certain I inside there. It's ineffable, perhaps even unknowable, because I am both the subject as well as the, trying, the, the, the entity trying to understand it. There's a... Uh, Islamic scholar who I think said it well, that to be human means um, I can look at truth and falsehood. It means to have free will. It means to be able to look at the real and the beautiful. These things we know now distinguish us as, as that. And yet, who are we to say that we cannot build devices that give us the illusion of that? What we know about the brain today is that it appears there is no secret sauce. There is no ether out there that we can yet find that says this is what animates us. And so science is leading us down the path that suggests there is a me mechanistic implementation to the soul. And AI is bringing us along that path from the computational perspective. Descartes said, I, dr I think, therefore I am. Another way to reframe it from a sentient perspective is, I dream, therefore I become. Can we build devices that dream? Now, on the one hand, you may say, no, there's no such possibility, because this requires intentionality and thoughts beyond ourselves. And yet, you can also make the case to say that, well, what is a dream? But the application of patterns of experience to some future case, and I can sure automate that. So where will that line live? I don't know, but we are very much on a path that is inescapable, it is irreversible, in which we and about 10,000 other folks around the world are going to explore that question. Will we reach the place where we build sentience? I believe yes. Will it happen soon? I'm not of the belief of Dr. Kurzweil, who thinks it's going to happen eminent. I think it's a long way off, but I do believe it's inevitable. But even then, if we don't achieve that degree of sentience, I believe we're very close to achieving the illusion of sentience, whereby we are in a place where we'll begin to, on a large-scale basis, have to interact with these things that we have co-created and co-evolved. And ultimately, it leads us with the inescapable question, how then shall we choose to live? For these devices will be very much present in our lives, and we shall co-evolve with them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. We're going we're to take about uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers here, and um, I have quite a few from the audience. First of sure. all, before we start taking the substantive questions on the lecture, Talk to us a little bit about where this project is, oh. now, computing the human experience. A little over a year ago, you were on stage with me, and we were doing this very thing, and we were on the cusp of our first lecture, and oh, what a difference a year makes. So to set the context, um, John, Jan, and I have been mulling this over for, what, four or five years? That's about right. Yeah, and Jan, wave your hand. She is my partner in crime. I would not be here without her in this, uh, my creative partner in this. This lecture is very much hers as it is mine. But our vision is to try to bring to the public the story of computing. <clears throat> and we believe it's a story that's entertaining. We believe it's a story that will be interesting to the intellectually curious. And it's a story we believe we will help inspire another generation of folks who will build this stuff.
So since I was last here, uh, KQED, who was present, Michael Issop was present here, he saw me do my shtick, he said, wow, that could make for really good TV. And so KQED has been our patron. They have sponsored the creation of a teaser and a budget and all these other accoutrements that we need. And we actually now have a schedule to go to corporate PBS where we are going to pitch the notion of uh, five-part series, five one-hour shows uh, on computing for national broadcast. So keep your fingers crossed, but come end of April, we will know more. At the same time, too, we have a book contract with O'Reilly, a series as well. We're looking for authors to speak in this space. And so our empire is growing. If someone does have a, um, a manuscript, and I know a couple of people, actually, yep. what should they do? Uh, come running up to me after we're done here. Okay, all right. Or follow me on Twitter <laughs> or come to our website. So Grady is at Grady underscore Booch, and that's a, that's a wonderful way both to follow him, follow the project, and and uh, submit ideas. So let me uh, just throw out a couple of questions sure. here. Uh, we have a couple of questions that are in the is, and yes. we have some questions that are the what will be. So sure. here, here are a couple of is questions. Uh, since Watson, we're going to go back to Watson sure. here. If Watson is uh, able to learn as it works, how is it programmed to do that? Oh, there are little elves inside. <laughs> <laughs> that is a longer question. Uh, long, uh, it's a simple question, but a longer answer. longer answer. And the short answer is, Watson is built upon a set of small programs that are built upon a thing called UEMA. UEMA is this pipe and filter architecture. And we hang on to Watson, lots of small programs that can do local things that they then can locally learn about it and change the overall behavior. If you want to know more details about it, come grab me afterwards. But there are basic learning algorithms, some classic learning stuff that happens inside Watson itself. OK. And there's another question following up on that. Um, since one's personal experiences play a great role in the development of uh, our intellectual capacity and ability, how is that incorporated into an AI capacity? Well, if you think of, so let me reframe the question. I think what the question is asking, our experience is an important part of our knowledge. And what is experience, though, other than us being fully present to sensory input around us, if you want to get to that level of thing? And so one could observe that the way an, a program could gain experience is by going through those kinds of inputs, that kind of learning, but much more rapidly we could do in real time. So we can build machines with experience, machines whose behavior today is based upon past behavior. We call these non-holonomic systems because they depend upon past behavior. And there are ways we know how to do those kinds of things, except that for humans, we've been doing this learning for several millennium. And within our lifetime, so our DNA shaped, but also within our lifetime of growing up, it's shaped by experience. The question we might ask is, how can we inject and program into pre-built experience, and how could we teach a machine at a faster rate than a human? Is Watson experiencing that now, or is, is it completely different with Watson? Watson's experiencing that now, except that we are the ones who must lobotomize Watson and give it a new knowledge base. So there's this whole knowledge ingestion piece that goes on with Watson, in which for the Jeopardy time frame, you know, we fed it Wikipedia and, and uh, lots of other things on the web and lots of encyclopedias. And now that it's being repurposed to uh, the medical fields, it's a matter of taking the knowledge from those fields and putting into Watson as well. Okay. But Watson is not yet able to say, that was a tasty morsel. I'd like to read about that. Watson hasn't gotten there yet. Okay. Got it. I think you addressed this actually on your very last slide with the I dream, therefore I become. But uh, just to sharpen it up a little bit, uh, here's a question. Is artificial imagination possible? Will computers ever be able to achieve creative thought and not just regurgitate information that we already know? Well, it depends upon what you mean by creative. So there are, in fact, there's a display downstairs of Aaron, which is a program that I think provides creativity in building, in, in making paintings. And you could look at those and say, wow, there's something in there, and yet we know it's a program. Similarly, there's a program called Emily Howell that, uh, uh, that creates classical music. Uh, Eric Whitaker, uh, a, a, a 
the gentleman whose music I love, does this experiment where he takes computer-generated music, I don't know if it's from Emily Howell or something else, and he plays it for some of his classical friends. And they will rave upon it, saying, it's wonderful, it's great. And then he will say, by the way, a computer program generated. And they'll say, oh, crap. <laughs> Actually, it may not be Eric. I think it's someone else who does that. But they'll still say, oh, crap. Because they, they listen to this music and they say, wow, it's really creative. But we know it's created by a program. So at least we pass the test that in the case of art and music, we have the ability to fool humans to some degree. So is that creative? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what would be the impact when a system like Watson or let's say the things that are on the back end of Siri evolve even further? Are, are they, I guess first of all, are they capable of evolution? And if they are capable, What's the logical destination we're going to hit? As far as I know, Siri's architecture, it's not. Siri handles a number of default questions which it knows of, and when it, and when it can't understand the answers to those, it'll punt it and either send you to the web or it'll use Wolfram Alpha. So there are no mechanisms there to go and learn. I can't read the mind of Google, so I don't know what they're doing in that space. But I do know in the path of some of the researchers I've encountered, there is an attempt to build conversational systems that are learning to a better degree. That's what some of the chatterbot work is doing right now. The Loebner Prize, I think it is, which is a prize run every year, which runs chatterbots against humans. I think we got to the point last year where it fooled 56% of the people most of the time. So we're getting closer and closer. Now, that's a superficial answer to your question, because there's another answer to your question, which is not well, what these devices do to us, but what will it what, what will they do for us? But what will it do to us? Because now, all of a sudden, I'm putting my brain here, and I no longer have to think about directions. I no longer have to think about these kinds of answers. So am I losing something in the process? And that's what Sherry Turkle, in her work Alone Together, is beginning to explore, or has explored. Uh, when we start surrendering ourselves to these devices, uh, what does it do to our brain? It rewires them to some degree. And what's the end game of that? I don't know. And that's why I speak of the notion of we're co-evolving, because we're building these things, and it's changing us just as we're changing them. Along those lines, uh, how much does a programmer working in this space need to understand neuroscience? How much, let's say, for example, does the team working on Watson spend time understanding neuroscience, or is that even relevant? It appears, from, from my outside view, there are two worlds going on here. You've got folks in the pure AI world, like the folks in Watson, who may have a passing understanding of it, and they may be subtly influenced by the notions of the architecture of the brain, but they're going off on one path. Then you have the folks behind the mapping project, the DARPA projects, the brain project in, in, in Europe, that are more on the architecture of the brain itself. And there's this fascinating beginning dialogue between the two that we're beginning to see a deeper conversation of them. There used to be that conversation in the early connectionist model, models of AI, and I think it kind of split apart because each of those worlds could make progress on their own. But now we're seeing those two worlds starting to come together. So final question, uh, the series is starting to evolve along these lines of mm -hmm. duality. So yes. last year was war and peace, today mm -hmm. is man and machine. Mm -hmm. What's the next one that you're going to be working on? We've got three others we have in mind. Um, let's see, there's wealth and poverty, the notion of the duality that we are building devices that were actually influenced by the need for decreasing the friction of economies, of our economies, and at the same time, they've changed the nature of our economies. So they've, they're a partial contributing factor to the disparity of wealth. We have one on, help me out here, Community in isolation, more along Sherry's work, which is the notion that we are building devices that connect us in ways that we could only dream of, and yet they are starting to isolate in ways we never anticipated. And then we have life and death, which is the notion that, yeah, which is, yeah, pretty, pretty clear. Yeah. And it also leads to the question, what happens to our digital bits after death as well, too? So let me give Lawyers just a, again. <laughs> a, a little plug. Uh, if you'd like to become a member of the museum, we have a membership table set up right outside. Today is a great time to join if you want to hear in advance about 
future lectures from Grady as this series continues to evolve. Members always hear about these things first, as well, of, uh, as well as all of our events in our lecture series, and there are a lot of other benefits too, so I hope you'll sign up today if you aren't already a member. Those of us who are on the journey with you are loving it. I think you're loving it too. It's, I'm having great fun. Thanks for sharing it with us today, Grady. Thanks Thank everyone for coming. Thank you.